a little bit of fun with it um, and, um, and learning how to use it for marketing and networking. Um, so what we're going to talk about is first, first of all, I want, I want to talk about why you might want to be on LinkedIn. And the, the way that I've kind of positioned this slide is really to talk about sort of my story with it. Um, when I started using LinkedIn, it was because I was a blogger. I started working as a writer in residence for Miss JD, which is a group about promoting women in the legal profession. And I was blogging. It was kind of an experimental thing I did for a year because I liked writing. I wanted to try it out. Um, and m nobody would see my post if I did not push them out on social media. I was not active on social media at that point. But because I had stuff to share, I started sharing it on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. And it was kind of interesting that people actually kind of liked it. It was the first time I had written about stuff that wasn't just legal topics and legal issues. And it was surprising that people from the internet who I did not know, um, I, I formed relationships with them. I started to build a reputation as a writer. And one thing that happened is I started pushing things out on LinkedIn. At first, nothing happened. I got almost no response. Then in 2019, I started to do some more original content and posts, mostly because I was following some other people on LinkedIn, like Frank Ramos, who many of you may know from DRI or I've heard of. And um, I just started to do my own stuff and people actually engaged with it. And I was really shocked. And it kind of went from there. At the time I started, I had about 500 connections on LinkedIn. And now I have more than 5,000 followers. Um, I've had posts that have um, some viral posts that have um, gotten, you know, 150,000 views um, and 2,000 likes and, and engagements. Um, I've written a lot more articles. Um, I actually was able to author a best selling anthology book last year with 19 other women lawyers about how we use LinkedIn during the pandemic. Um, and I launched my blog, and part of that is because of the experience I've had on LinkedIn. Um, the exposure and reaching out to people helps other people see you, and it puts you in contact with other creators and other content um, make uh, people who make content. And so I've gotten numerous podcast appearances, opportunities to speak, um, referrals. Um, there was a time that I wrote one post on LinkedIn about uh, a jury trial I had done. Um, and it was more of really a story about uh, meeting the juror and the community afterwards. But I got a referral to help uh, an attorney pick a jury in my town, uh, which was which was cool, fun work to do just from that post. Um, but the real reason that I keep writing and I keep engaging on LinkedIn is that I have fun with it. Um, I enjoy creating the content. I can I've learned how to reuse and recycle the content for other purposes and turn it into presentations or blog posts or articles. Um, and I just get put into contact with lots of amazing people across the world that I never would have found otherwise. And so the reason to get active on LinkedIn, I would probably think of it less as about like a direct business model. Like you do this and you get this specific kind of return, um, but you, it's probably much less specific, but you will get returns. And I think it's really an enjoyable and fun way to go about it. So when you want to start getting active on LinkedIn, I think a lot of people think, I don't want to post, that freaks me out, I'm terrified the internet is a dark and scary place. And I think like to some degree you're right. If you're talking, if I was talking to you about like Twitter, I would agree. I don't use Twitter that much because there's a lot of trolls, it can be scary, and people can be really mean. I find LinkedIn is much, much nicer. But the thing about like being afraid of posting on the internet and being afraid of being imperfect um, the way to go about that, I think, is really to ease into it. So you don't have to start posting right away. I think that there's some LinkedIn housekeeping that a lot of people could do um, right off the bat where, where they're not even thinking about posting that it might help them. So the first thing is to get your profile in order. Um, many people with LinkedIn accounts have no profile picture at all. So it's the picture day and the kid didn't show up with the smiley face situation in the yearbook, right? Um, no profile picture at all. And then they have for their banner image, which is this blue area behind the profile picture, this blank nondescript generic uh, banner image that LinkedIn provides. The reason this is a problem is um, on LinkedIn, um, you'll notice here that I go by the name Claire E. Parsons. 
The reason for that is there are other Claire Parsonses. In fact, there is another Claire Parsons who is a lawyer down in Texas. And when you're talking about LinkedIn, um, your profile will come up really quickly in Google search results. Um, and so if they come, if they, or if people search for you on LinkedIn, um, they're going to find numerous other people and they may find other people with the same name who are also lawyers, maybe even in your jurisdiction. When the point of the internet is to be found. So when you want, when you want people to find you, you need to give multiple indicators of how to find you. So they may have talked to you at a networking event and they forgot your name. Um, or they, but they look for attorneys um, in your firm or for something, and then they find your picture and they can find you. Or they may remember your name, but they need to make sure the person that they're looking for is you. So you got to get this profile picture. You want it to be relatively current, so it actually looks like you. Um, your your law school composite picture is probably not a good choice if you've been practicing for 20 years. Um, but you also want to with see how my picture is relatively zoomed in so you can see my face. Remember that people are often looking at LinkedIn on their phone or a small portable device. So you want to zoom in on the picture relatively um, a good amount and you can um, adjust that when you um, update your profile. You want to zoom in so we can actually see you. So this banner that I have created back here this is something I made for myself on a tool called Canva, which is also the tool that I'm using for this presentation today um, instead of PowerPoint. Um, and it works a lot like PowerPoint where you can add images and text and, uh, and edit and adjust, but it's a pretty easy tool. You can use it for free to make a, a, um, a banner image for yourself. Right now, um, LinkedIn also provides, I think some image templates that you can use or you can just get an image that meets the, the size requirement on LinkedIn. And when you hit the button to try to put something in, it'll give you the pixel numbers to be able to do that. I would at a minimum recommend some kind of image to get some realist, to, to, to at least make your profile look a little bit more visually interesting. But I would just say like, to the extent you can make your own custom banner, this right here is unused real estate. Um, so at least some, some little thing about you um, and something about like what you do would be a great thing to, to put. I have put my blog here, Brilliant Legal Mind, um, because that's something about me and that's just something that's pretty new. So I wanted to put that, but I have adjusted this over time to, to meet whatever needs I really wanna meet. The other thing you're gonna see on the profile is this headline. And what Deborah read about me at the beginning is this headline here, which is right under your name. And I have used some emojis to get these little orange um, uh, diamonds in here to sort of separate out the things just to make them easier to read. But I will say like, I have what I do as for my, for a living obviously first, but I have the other things about me here as well because that tells you who I am as a person. Um, and I put the stuff about mom to unruly girls, proud introvert. And it's amazing how much people actually respond to that. They notice that on LinkedIn and they want to talk to me about it. And, you know, so what I have found from creating content on LinkedIn and blogging otherwise is it's, it's interesting that people want to know who you are as a person before they want to know what you do um, for your job. And it's when they trust you as a person and they like you as a person, that's when they want to do the extra um, work to learn about you in terms of your job and what you know. Um, and when people like you as a person and they trust you as a person, that's when they will actually send you work or want to hire you. And so this is part of, of that objective is, you know, showing who I am as a person. Now I'll tell you, if you're new to this, if you're getting into, if you're just updating your profile the first time in 10 years, it may take a while for you to tweak this. I've changed and played with this headline quite a bit. I look at it every few months just to see if it still fits. Um, and, you know, sometimes something just comes to me and I, I go with it, but like, I wouldn't overthink it, but I would say the more you can be a human being in addition to a great lawyer and showcase that on social media, the better off you are. So one small thing that you can also do for your profile is to make your own custom URL and that, so if you have not done this, your name, what you probably have um, for your URL, um, for your link for, to your profile is something that's like linkedin.com slash your name and then a bunch of random numbers and digits and things. 
And that's just doesn't look very good. And it, you know, it just is something that if you want to send it to other people, they may not know what you're sending them. So what you can do is if you go to your profile, there's a link right up here that says edit your public URL. And then a thing that will pop off that says your public profile settings. And then it says edit custom URL. And then what will happen is you hit that, um, you hit the little pencil here, you hit that and then you enter whatever your link is. I have chosen Claire E. Parsons for mine because that's my name. Um, but like that, you can pick whatever you want to do. And some, I've even seen some attorneys get very creative with it, um, where they might be like, I'm the contract master or I'm the litigation king or whatever. You know, some of those kind of things are kind of neat, but like I generally, it's going to just be your name so that it looks nice. It looks crisp. You can include it in your email signature. You can send it out. Um, you can use it otherwise. It's just a small thing you can do to help your profile. So about an experience. So I do have some of the information that Deborah talked about in the wider body of my profile. Um, the headline and your name, those are the things that people are gonna see right away on LinkedIn and on a phone, they would actually have to scroll down quite a bit to get to the rest. So your about and your experience, they are there. So you can add jobs, you can add publications, you can add volunteer experience, you can add um, membership in different organizations. Um, and like, for instance, I have my blog as one of my experiences as well. And you can kind of customize that and do that as you like. And I recommend that you keep that updated and keep that information accurate. Um, within the body of your experience, though, you have the ability to add additional text under the, the heading that's additional to what you would put in a resume that can tell the story of your career progression. Um, and I have actually been at my firm the entirety of my career, but I have gone through the process of sort of describing how the phases of my career have gone to tell the story of how I've gone from law clerk to equity partner in a firm and to say how I've gone from one area of practice to the another and how it's morphed and changed over the years. And I think it's good to do because it tells people about you if they wanna learn more. But in terms of your about thing, which is your brief bio, um, I would encourage you to talk about your practice briefly and, and not only say what you do, but why you do it, what makes you do it and what makes you really good at it. But I also would say, add something about your life that you bring to your practice that makes you a specifically unique person to handle whatever matter you handle. Um, so I have kind of a weird situation and that I'm a lawyer. I also really like writing and I am a meditation teacher. And it absolutely, that combination absolutely helps my practice. Um, it helps me have skills to handle stress of the job. It helps me have skills to communicate clearly to be assertive, but also balanced in my approach to understand the emotions that often arise in my cases. I'm a school lawyer, so I'm dealing with angry parents a lot. So that is absolutely an asset. And I talk about that and I blend that together in my about section. Now, again, if this is the first time you've looked at your profile in a while, it may take some tweaks and some edits to get it exactly right. But I think it's worth the time because if people are finding you on the internet, they're going to give you a few minutes and you need to speak to them right away. You need to get their attention and make them want to read more. Um, and one thing is when you talk about your about, if you talk, to, you write your about like you're talking to them. So you want to say, I do this, I do that, instead of talking about yourself in the third person, because it will engage with them a lot more that way. So there's another part about LinkedIn profiles that I think is underutilized um, by a lot of people. And this is the featured section. If you scroll down in LinkedIn uh, below your profile, um, below your uh, about, like there is a featured section that you can um, feature posts that you may create. You can also feature links to other content. You can feature videos, articles, um, all kinds of things. Now, there are some tricky issues with embedding, in particular from YouTube sometimes. So you may have to finagle that and play with that a little bit. But like, it is a great way to feature your work and let people see what you are about. I also think it's really helpful to use the featured section um, for the simple reason that 
Um, LinkedIn is a lot of white space and blue um, blocks. And so if you add some stuff in the featured section that have some images that showcase what you do and um, can actually showcase some of the work you've done or articles you've written or even presentations, it, it's just something that attracts the eye and gets people to click and look deeper. Um, and it's a way to showcase your work. And so, you know, the reason that we, we write articles and we do presentations is to demonstrate our expertise. So this is just an opportunity to um, bring your expertise right into your profile. Um, so your accomplishments. Um, I would definitely recommend, you know, when you have a new publication, if you can get it on LinkedIn and if you can link to it, you should do that. If there are honors and awards you've gotten, if you are involved in new organizations, um, I think you should get it up on your profile and just keep it relatively current. The great thing about LinkedIn in comparison to firm websites is it's a lot easier to update. And I bet that you have probably received a million emails in the past that tell every time somebody gets a new job or they get a new thing on their profile. That was an old feature in LinkedIn and you can change that in your security settings now. And I think the default now is to not send those notifications out to everybody. Um, so, you know, that's, um, that's something, but I would definitely update your accomplishments regularly because if you get them, you, you want to get the value from those. And part of that is updating your profile. So just to recap the profile thing, and this is, this is just showing you what a profile looks like on the phone. And I kind of just raise your attention to this. So if you are updating your profile picture, if you are updating your banner, if you're looking at all this other stuff, go ahead and pull up your profile on your phone and just make sure it looks right. Because when you do the sizing stuff, when you do these adjustments, it may push the profile picture over in front of the banner and it may look weird. So just take a look at that and be mindful of the fact that you are writing for people that are looking at it on a you know three by four inch screen. Um, but what you want for your profile is a good profile picture, uh, a decent headline, um, a good banner image, get your custom link updated. And that's something where you do it once, you probably never need to do it again. Um, you can get your contact information updated. I will tell you, um, you know, I wouldn't put anything out there that, you know, is more detailed than what's on your website. Because um, one thing that does happen about LinkedIn is people do find you and they can contact you. So you have to use your own judgment about what contact information you want to provide. Since I use LinkedIn a lot and I actually respond to messages, I don't have my email address on LinkedIn. Um, but like it's already on my website so people can find you anyway. So you have to make a choice about what you want to do with that in terms of your security. Um, so you also want to have a good about section, fill out the featured and update your experience and accomplishments. Um, so the next thing that you want to, you can do on LinkedIn before you, before you ever even think about posting or creating content or doing articles or anything like that is expanding your network. And I will tell you, if you have, if you currently, if you pull up your LinkedIn profile and you have fewer than 500 connections, I would tell you that your first homework is to get to 500 connections. If you're a lawyer and you've been practicing for a certain number of years, I think that you will find that getting to 500 connections is fairly easy. Um, once you get to 500, you know, you don't necessarily have to work as hard. Uh, unless you really want to work on expanding your network. I don't think you necessarily have to have 10,000 connections or anything like that. Um, adding to my network and growing the size of it has never been really the thing that appealed to me about LinkedIn. It was more of a side effect and unintended benefit. Um, but some people can do it real efficiently where they go out and they find new connections and they really expand their network and they, they get a lot of benefit about it. So if you are like a numbers person and you like that kind of consistent organization and that strategy of it, that's pretty cool. And you can do a lot of things with that. But it, the first thing I think you need to do is to get to 500 connections, because if you're lower than 500, LinkedIn really dings you in terms of your um your uh, search results in terms of you coming up in search results and people being able to find you. So I would definitely get to your 500. Um, but like, I know that the, as we talked about, the internet can be a dark and scary place. Um, and so there is 
there's all these security concerns that people have. There's all these worries about the internet. Uh, but the point of being on a, net, a site like LinkedIn or frankly on social media is to communicate with other people. And if you want to grow your network, that means talking to people you don't know. That means interacting with people you don't know. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have security settings. It doesn't mean you tolerate all kinds of nonsense. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying the initial thing of being open to talking to people you don't know and, and meeting people you don't know is part of the game if you want to grow your network and market and do things on social media. So I would say that in general, if you are just refusing connection requests from people you don't know because you don't know them, I would probably examine that. Instead, what I would say is, what are your criterion that you're using for refusing people? Um, I generally accept them from lawyers. I mean, in general, I accept them from most people, uh, unless it's pretty clear to me that there are going to be just trying to sell me something and they're just going to send me a bunch of annoying messages and I'm going to end up blocking them anyway. Um, so most of the time I accept requests unless there's some reason not to. Um, so, but if you, um, if you are real restrictive about that, you, you, that's, that's your personal choice and we all have to make our personal choices, but it's going to be harder for you to grow your network if you can't um, allow yourself to be connected to other people. And I will also say like, you know, connecting with someone on social media, connecting a LinkedIn, um, connecting with someone on LinkedIn, I don't think is equivalent to connecting with someone on Facebook. You know, I think it's a little bit different in terms of the tone and subject matter of what you're talking about. Uh, and the other thing is, if you connect um, some a, a request, an accept, a connection request from someone, um, you just and they act up, then you block them and you report them. And I have done that in the past. I don't have to do that very often, but like you know that that resolves the issue. So it's a connection request, but it is one that you can sever um, when needed. And this is sort of the same way that we, you know, the same way we have to you know, go about our lives. We, we create relationships with people, but if they become problematic, then we end those relationships. And LinkedIn is a little bit like that. Um, so I would say that if you want to grow your network, you got to start uh, opening yourself up a little bit to people you don't know. Um, I will say that the vast majority of the people I've encountered on LinkedIn have been kind, decent, amazing people, and I'm fortunate to have uh, met them. So for your privacy settings, I would say if you're getting on LinkedIn, go take a look at them and just set them how you want because there's a lot of different options that, that, that are available. But I would definitely say look at settings and privacy and specifically visibility and communications. Because if you have your settings set to restrictive, it will be a problem in terms of you showing up in search results, you getting connection requests from people, um, you even communicating with other people via messages. Because if, if people are reaching out to you to talk about ideas um, or to talk about opportunities, you want to be open to accepting that. So you don't want to block yourself. And the reality from the internet that we know is you can put yourself out there all you want, but people are not going to work that hard to find you. If they have to go to a certain, a separate place to find you, it's very likely that they may just find another lawyer or find someone else to do it. So you don't wanna make them work too hard for this. Um, and so this is again, something that probably you look at these and then you never have to do it again or you just look at it every few months to make sure it's not um, a problem for you. So requesting to connect with other people, you can do that on LinkedIn and I recommend that you do. Um, you can include a message that explains why you want to connect um, or if you have common interest or something like that. Sometimes that is helpful and some people see that as you just want to connect with them to sell them something. Um, I generally say if you're going to send a message to somebody asking to connect, look like a human and do not make it look like a form request where it looks like you're going to you know, lead into a sales pitch because that is something that does commonly happen on LinkedIn. Um, but I wouldn't overthink it. You can also just not do messages. I used to do messages and now I don't because I haven't really noticed that it really makes a difference. Um, sometimes, um, you know, if there's a specific reason or if it seems kind of off the wall, I'll do it, but anymore, I don't. Um, one thing that I do in terms of figuring out who to ask to connect with 
um, is a lot of times I go to people who have commented and engaged with my post, especially if I, I like what they say. If I see a post or other content that I think is really neat, I will, you know, connect with them. Um, I, a lot of times, any new contacts I have in real life, um, and I know we're not necessarily meeting in person quite as much, but any new contacts, I'll usually look them up and connect on LinkedIn. Um, but you can also get suggestions. So if you're, if you're less than 500 and you want to boost that up, go to my network and you will kind of check back there regularly and send a few connection requests. Odds are there's gonna be at the beginning, at least there's gonna be people that you know in your area that you just haven't connected with. And that's a quick way to get to 500. Um, and if you send out a few every day or a few every week, you'll get, you'll increase that over time. Um, and this, my network thing, it will kind of repopulate over time as you go back to it. So the more connections you add, then you kind of get um, the algorithm kind of adjust based on all the connections in that person's network. And then it kind of can expand. And that's how, how it works so that I would kind of go just check this weekly and add in some new people that you maybe don't have already. And I also, another idea for getting new connections is, is groups. Now, LinkedIn groups, I will tell you, are just terrible. Um, they aren't active. If you are in Facebook groups, you probably are. You probably are. Facebook, I think the the gold of Facebook is the groups um, because a lot of times Facebook becomes kind of a dumpster fire with people yelling about politics and fighting about all kinds of stuff. But like the groups, I think are fantastic because there's a lot of really good ones and nice supportive people in them. Um, LinkedIn is different because people don't go to LinkedIn for groups the same way and they just are structured differently. One thing I will tell you though, if you get into groups, you can connect with people in those groups. So DRI, and I just pointed this out because you know, we're, you're the, a state affiliate of DRI. Um, so DRI is a large group. I, they have lots of, um, lots of uh, members in it. It's not a very active group, but if you get into the DRI group, you can go look through who's in that group and engage with people there. And it's odds are you'll probably find some people you know um, another thing about groups though, and I've circled this little bell up here, when you get into a group, if you want to actually see the content that may be posted there, the, the reason that groups I think don't work very well on LinkedIn is that notification defaults um, basically don't give anyone notifications when content is posted in a group unless you ask for it. So this little bell is the notification bell. So if you click on this, uh, and you adjust your settings to actually get notified when new posts are made, you will see it and it'll keep you, you'll, you'll be more updated in terms of what goes on in the group. And so when you do that and you see the more content, then you'll, you're able to reach out to people who, you know, um, share content or do things that you're interested in. So if you want to start actually posting, um, posts or articles, um, you know, this is, this is the part that talks about that. Um, so, and I will say LinkedIn allows you to do articles. I don't really do LinkedIn articles. I've done a couple of them. They don't tend to always get a lot of engagement, um, but it can be good to do articles to create a track record of your work because they, they will kind of last a long time and they are something that can demonstrate your expertise. Um, I have my own blog and have just written elsewhere. Um, but if you want to start writing longer form documents or longer form things that are more like a blog post or an article, LinkedIn articles are an option. Um, I'm really talking here about actual posts and actual posts are much, much shorter. The limits for characters for LinkedIn is 1300. Now LinkedIn has just rolled out a new mode called creator mode for people with greater than 3000 connections that you can enable. Um, and I have done so. And I believe that the limits for characters on posts for people with creator mode is 3000 characters. I would recommend that if you are posting on LinkedIn, even if you can do 3000 characters, I would keep it shorter than that. Um, you don't necessarily need a LinkedIn post is not a blog post. Um, a LinkedIn post is maybe a third of a, a good blog post. And so, you know, people are just not going to read that much. Um, but if you are going to start posting on LinkedIn, 
Um, what a lot of people start doing when they start sharing things on social media is what I did at first. They start sharing articles and external content. They, they make just kind of generic statements about, I presented at this seminar today, or I got this award, or I won this trial. And as exciting as some of those things are, people on LinkedIn don't care because everybody else is doing that. Um, so the problem with sharing external content is that LinkedIn doesn't like it. LinkedIn wants you to create your own content because they want people to stay on LinkedIn. So she, you and I, I share external content now. I have my blog post and I share those on LinkedIn. I share other things at some at sometimes I sometimes share other people's posts. I do it knowing that it's not going to get as good of a reception as something might when I uh, share my own post and own content. So just be aware of that. Uh, if you're going to start posting on LinkedIn consistently, you need to think about doing some of your own original stuff that's on LinkedIn. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be super hard. So the procedures that I go by when I post is that I want to have some relative consistency. At times, I have posted every day. Um, right now, I am doing more like uh, three or four times a week. Um, but you want to keep some consistency to it. If you only post on LinkedIn irregularly, um, you likely won't get a great response. You may, you may get a good response if you've got a nice picture and it's a good story or like something really big happened. But if you do that the next day um, or if you do that like two weeks from now, odds are it may not happen because the algorithm also benefits you if you are using the platform consistently as opposed to every you know month or so. Um, you want a catchy intro line. You need to get people's attention from the get-go. If you don't get their attention in the first second, they're not going to give you the next 20 to read your post. Um, you want it to be personal and original. So part of what I have talked about is that um, you know, I write on LinkedIn about legal issues and my life as a lawyer quite a bit. Um, but I also write about my life as a working mom. I write about mindfulness and meditation a lot. I write about writing a lot because writing is fun to me. And a lot of people who are on LinkedIn um, really want to hear about writing because a lot, the, the platform really favors writing and content creation. Um, uh, it should have a story if you can. If you can tell something in the form of a story instead of um, just making an announcement, it'll be completely different. So like, instead of saying, I was so happy to do a presentation on this topic today, you could say, um, I did, it was such a great time talking about this topic today. I know a lot of people feel like this is a dry topic, but I got some really insightful questions and I covered these topics. And I think that there's a lot of value in X, Y, and Z and bullet point out what you did. Um, and then share it or something like, you know, I really struggled to, you know, I, I had a convert, I had a presentation today and I was worried about how it would go. And, um, but people were really kind and decent. And I really appreciated some people in the front row nodding and smiling along to keep me going. And I'm glad I got to cover X, Y, and Z. So the, the difference is you're not just announcing information randomly, but sharing something personal that people can connect and engage with and understand. What I want you to understand with some of this is that we are lawyers. And so as lawyers, we are often thinking that we are appealing to people's head. We're using logic, we're using reason, we're using organization to appeal to people's head. But we are most persuasive. We are most um, effective as lawyers when we understand that we grab them by the heart and that's when we can get them at the head, right? We got to connect with them at least a little bit emotionally and as human beings, before they will listen to us in terms of what we know. And if you can master that in, on LinkedIn or frankly in, in your practice, um, you can do a whole lot uh, of good and reach a whole lot of people. Another thing to do is to encourage engagement. And usually the way to do this is, is at the end to ask a question, ask for people to engage, ask for their thoughts. Some of the best posts on LinkedIn are the ones where people aren't saying, I'm such an expert, I know everything, here is my worldly wisdom. Some of the best posts are when people say, this is an issue that I've noticed and I'm kind of struggling with, and what do you guys think? 
and everybody chimes in. And so it's really more, you're not necessarily, you're becoming a thought leader, but you're doing it by starting a conversation. And when you want to meet people, you want to start those conversations. And some of it is signaling that you are a safe person to talk to and share information and ideas with. And so, so ending your post with a question is really a great thing to do. Um, for LinkedIn posts, it's a good idea to include some white space. So you don't necessarily just want a single paragraph of text that is difficult and dense to read. Remember, people might be reading it on a phone and they might be used to more scrolling and you know, getting bits of information as they go. So I would, you can do a few lines of text, but I would sort of break it up. I would also, to some degree, use some images, which may be emojis. Um, I know that sounds maybe a little silly for lawyers, but they can help to convey some emotion and some interest in a post that otherwise um, would be boring if it was just text and just images that you can create um, or even just a picture of yourself on occasion. And I wouldn't use more than three hashtags. That has been the conventional wisdom on LinkedIn for the last few years. I haven't heard anything that, that changes it. Um, and if you can use the well-used hashtags, um, I know like, you know, it used to be kind of a funny thing um, to make up your own hashtag that was like a million letters long. Um, but I don't, I, you know, that if you do that as a joke, that's one thing. But like, if you use the hashtags that only have three followers, it's just not going to help your post. So you can actually go on LinkedIn and type in a hashtag and look at it to see how much it's used. Um, but like you also want to use the hashtags that are consistent with what you do. So a lot of the hashtags I use are lawyers, mindfulness, uh, meditation, working moms, um, writing, networking, introvert. Um, those hashtags are pretty standard and well used and they will help uh, people find your post a little bit more. So these are just a few examples of like visual interest that you can include. Um, and I just, I made these, so these are just little emojis and you can download and get an emoji deck as a Chrome extension on your web browser. Um, I recommend doing that even though LinkedIn has some emoji capabilities and comments because you won't be able to use emojis as an option in every area on your profile. Like if you wanna add it into your headline, if you wanna add it into any part of your profile, um, you know, you won't be able to do it. And you don't always have to use silly ones like this. The emoji decks also include like bullets and things like that. Um, and sometimes like little thumbtacks that people use as bullets or other shapes. Um, and it's just something, it's just a tool to have to make your profile a little bit more interesting. These images are a couple that I made for posts. Um, and this one is one where I had to go to court in person last year and I wore a mask and I made a funny one um, about it, like I was a superhero. And um, this one actually did really, really good. Um, and then this one is one on, for a post about mentoring that I made. And this is a simple block of text, a green background, and then these images that I just positioned on it to make it look like a path. Um, so that one took just a couple minutes to make. So if you are not ready to post, that is okay. Um, don't worry about it. It's, you know, it took me kind of a long time to work up to it. And I think most people that I know that are, you know, dominating on LinkedIn took their time with it. So the, the first thing that you can do is follow people or pages that interest you. Um, because if they interest you, you'll want to engage with their content um, and it'll be fun. Um, you can regularly check your feed at least, you know, a couple, every couple days or every day or whatever. Um, and then the, the next thing is to add some comments. When you want to say something, say something. And I know people are nervous about commenting on posts or with people they don't know. Um, but the thing on LinkedIn is LinkedIn posts do well if they have more engagement, which means likes and especially comments. LinkedIn loves comments. So when you comment on someone's post, they generally are gonna respond, if they have any sense, they're gonna respond to that favorably. Now, as long as you're being respectful and you know helpful, and I'm not saying you have to agree with them, but agree in a polite and a professional way or disagree in a polite and professional way. But if you are commenting on someone's post, that helps them, okay? So generally people are gonna respond well to that and that might be an a way to interact with them. And it's the same as talking to someone you don't know at a networking event. It's the same thing. It's just, you're doing it in written form. 
Um, so when you add those comments, now if they respond to you with nastiness or they're rude, don't support them anymore. Um, you know, sometimes I see posts on LinkedIn and I really hate them, um, or I see posts elsewhere and I hate them, and I decide not to comment because I don't want to help their post out. Uh, so, you know, if people are nasty, don't support them. That's all you got to do. Um, but like adding the comments is one way to get started. I'll tell you, I got started by commenting myself. I would comment on Frank Ramos's posts. I comment on other people um, who post a lot. And what I noticed was lots of people liked my comments and then they started sending me connection requests and following me. And that was kind of really surprising. And I was like, oh, maybe that should be a good post. And that's kind of what happened. And now I even still like, I'll comment on a friend's post and um, realize, hey, that's a really good idea. I'll do a post about it. So that's kind of the way to get started if you're skittish and it's okay to be skittish. It is kind of nerve wracking to feel like you have to be perfect because you're posting to strangers on the internet. But the truth is once the more you do it, you realize you don't have to be perfect. So just to give you some examples of who to follow, um, I'm on LinkedIn. I accept connection requests from people. Send me a connection request or follow me. I'm happy to, to do that. My blog, Brilliant Legal Mind, is on LinkedIn. Um, it's about mindfulness and meditation for lawyers, um, and we try to keep it fun and informative. Please go follow. I would appreciate it. Um, DRI is on LinkedIn, and they have a LinkedIn group. Follow them, and you will likely see members and people that you know being mentioned. That's a way to engage with it. And the MDTC, it is not a company page, but an, a, an, an individual page. Um, you can connect with MDTC, and I'm sure Deborah would really appreciate it if you did. So those are just a few examples. And the more you kind of engage and find and follow people, you'll get recommendations. Things will come into your feed that may be of interest to you, and then you can hit follow. Um, it helps people to follow them. They usually will look at it with favor. If people are using LinkedIn, that's what they want you to do. They will not think you're a weirdo or a creep or anything like that. Um, they, they want you to connect and engage with them if they're creating content. Okay, so that is the end of the presentation piece of it. Um, has, does anyone have any questions at this point? I actually had one, Claire. You mentioned a, um, uh, I don't think it was an app, I think it was a software that you used to make that presentation that wasn't PowerPoint. What is that? Yes, and I can pull that back up because I was I was going to do sort of a demonstration on that. Let me find my folder real quick. So the tool that I was talking about is um, Canva. And let me make sure I have it. OK, so this is the tool I'm talking about, and it is Canva. OK, so Canva is this little tool where it has all kinds of um, it's, it's basically like PowerPoint in, in some ways. So it has templates and it has blank freeform stuff that you can use to create images. Um, so you've probably seen a million Canva images and just didn't know it because almost everybody uses it. It's a very popular tool. Um, and there are free versions of it that you can use. You can use free Canva accounts. Um, I have a paid version because I have a blog and need lots of images and I do not wanna mess with paying per image for stuff. I think it's absolutely well worth it. So I have made all of these images and I, I will tell you all, my visual abilities and my artistic abilities are absolutely nil. I, I mean, I am not a visual person. I do not, I cannot draw. I, I don't understand like form and shape and all of that stuff. I've never been interested in art, but I have used um, Canva to make some images to do some fun things. And like this one is one of my favorites, uh, the the more, more law you know one. Um, you know, if you remember like from the, uh, from like the eighties um, where they used to have that come off of your shows that you watched as a kid. Um, cause I got like, I was just kind of making a joke about a legal letter I got where somebody kind of said something not quite right. And I had to like school them a little bit. So like this one is kind of a fun one. Um, and then there's like some inner, like just inspirational ones or whatever, but I can show you how to just, you know, make, um, 
a design real quick. Let me see. So if you want to do a post, so this is like an Instagram size post. And you can go over here to select photos. Um, you can select little like graphics and images. You can do text boxes. Uh, you can even embed and you can do background pictures and things. Um, so you can also embed audio and video and do videos. You can also do a slide deck that you then animate and turn into a video and download for social media or other purposes. Um, so it's really a very flexible tool. But you, one of the things you can do besides social media is do PowerPoint presentations um, and, um, and use them. And they have some really just fun, neat stuff that PowerPoint doesn't have. So it's just a different option to use. So, um, so any other questions at this point? I didn't have anything else. That was um, okay. So was I've useful. got um, I've got some examples of posts that I was going to share. I've got just uh, I, I PDF'd several um, posts that I have done in the past, and I just wanted to share some of these to give you some ideas of some posts that actually have worked. So this is one that went viral um, for me last year, um, right before the pandemic. Um, and it is, I mean, the lesson from this one is that stories matter and people, you know, people care about helping other people. They care about helping students. And so I just wrote a real quick post one day saying a lawsuit reached out to me. He had met a friend of mine at a networking thing. And I told him, you know, I'm busy, but I told him yes. And I wouldn't even think of not saying yes. And the reason is I had done that as a law student. And I did not want to clerk for my firm as a law student because I thought I wanted to do plaintiff's work. And I thought I wanted to live out of town. And my job is I, I'm practicing where I grew up. And I went to meet the lawyer, um, a lawyer in town who my law professor introduced me to. He talked to me for like an hour and a half. And when I brought up my firm and that I had a clerk uh, offer to clerk there, he said such nice things about the firm he had practiced against that I realized it was a sign and I called and accepted the job and now I'm a partner there. So um, it was just a quick post about small meetings with people, helping people can make a difference. And it got uh, over 2,200 likes, 100 comments and 150,000 views. And I think up to that point, it had only, I don't think I had gotten really anything over 10, I, I don't believe. so. You know, these things can spread far and wide. And I will say it's kind of like, I'm glad, like, if I go viral, like, it's like something nice, right? So just <laughs> be kind and uplifting in your post because you never know what might happen. Um, so uh, here's one where, you know, honestly, this was kind of a random post one night. Um, I was kind of dealing with like a scary case, I think, a couple months ago. And so this kind of just came out like one night late. And it did really well, like 10,000 views, uh, almost 200 engagements. And it's really just about, you know, the fact that, you know, I'm still scared, even though I'm a good lawyer and, you know, I, I keep going and here's how. Inspirational and motivational posts on LinkedIn generally do pretty well. But what you'll notice about this one is I have this, um, this uh, call to action at the end, asking people to chip, chime in with their thoughts. And then I've got my uh, three hashtags. So um, that's kind of, it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, I think, you know, and I think like this lead in line, I have some bad news for you is kind of something that makes you automatically curious, right? And they wanna, they wanna read more. So that's kind of, you know, how it works. Um, this one was a kind of a fun one. Um, so, I, this one's more about telling a story. So this one, I actually have an image with it. Um, and this is me um, outside with my kids after we had a stressful day. And I just sort of, because lawyers, we have a lawyer wellness problem because everyone deals with this. Um, you know, I sort of told a story and I painted a picture with this one. I had the, I had the picture, 
but I also kind of talked talked through specifically what I did. I gave some like sensory information. Um, I told what my daughters were doing. I told what I heard. I told what I felt. It was it was it reads more like a novel than a legal brief. And I think because of the story factor, people liked it and people liked the picture too. Um, and I think sometimes people just like seeing pictures of other people being happy. And so sometimes this can be kind of a simple thing, but this one did pretty well. I think this was uh, like 300 likes or something like that. So, you know, it's kind of interesting that you don't necessarily, I, I don't know, always think like you're saying the most impactful thing or profound thing, but you can make a difference to people. Um, here's one where I kind of, you know, had kind of a fun idea. I talked about the idea of litigation karma, where, you know, um, a couple weeks ago, somebody um, had trouble getting to a deposition because of family issues. And then a couple weeks later, I had the same problem and we worked it out with the power of Zoom depositions. And so talked about this. Um, I kind of had this interesting idea because litigation karma, nobody knows exactly what they, that means. So they want to look for they want to look further into the post to read it. And again, told a story and then at the end invited the conversation. Um, here's like a funny one I did for Mother's Day where my daughter made a um, like fake magazine cover uh, thing for me for Mother's Day at school and said I was mother of the year. And so I uh, did a post about it, like pretending that it was a real award and kind of making jokes about it. Um, and so this was kind of funny. And I think because it's Mother's Day and it's fun stuff. Um, and, you know, talking about being a working mom and all of that, you know, this one did pretty well and people liked it. So this is one where I talk about, you know, um, this is me being a person and not just a lawyer. Um, so, and actually somebody in my feed, uh, I think thought it was a real award and shared it and said, congratulations. <laughs> so maybe I was a little too good with that one. Well, um, I had to read it twice, but I saw it when it was posted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, my daughter thought it was a real award. Um, well, it was a real award. <laughs> so this one is kind of a funny one where I, this is a LinkedIn post where I actually used the word poop in it. And it was because I was talking to my daughter uh, late, late uh, in the year this year for school. She was struggling with virtual school in February and March. And I gave her a motivational speech. And because she's nine, um, you know, I talked to her using her language and if you're a parent, you understand poop is part of it. So, you know, I just kind of joked and said, you know, I know this is hard, like, let's get through it. Let's not make it worse. And it worked. And so this is kind of just something where you can see that you can really be truly who you are and talk really how you are. Um, and I think people want you to be real. Now, am I saying that you should, you should use that word in every post? No. And I don't but you can be a real person and people, people are not necessarily as afraid of that as you might think. Um, this is really you know, solving a problem and showing that you, know, you can handle what really comes up in life. And so that's really what the post is about. So you can have a sense of humor with it. Would I have done that post at, at first when I started writing on LinkedIn? Absolutely not. I was very wooden and robotic and wasn't able to, you know, um, talk about things quite so um, bluntly, I guess, but like, and I don't necessarily do that in every post, but I think it's just some, it kind of shows you that you don't, this, this perfect austere sort of guarded way that we present ourselves online is I think a lot of times something that keeps lawyers from connecting with other people and really getting the engagement and the um, interaction with people that we are looking for when we're trying to network and market. So Claire, this, uh, this looks like a lot of fun. And um, I've, I've read some of your posts and, and enjoyed them. And, um, but it takes a lot of time. Obviously, I can tell you put a lot of time into it. Um, and there's multiple reasons for doing it. I mean, you enjoy it, you, you like writing, but on the very practical perspective, do you get work from it? Does your firm get work? Do you get referrals? I do. I mean, I it's so with networking and marketing, 
it's very difficult in a lot of cases to tell why right. you got work. Um, but I will tell you, um, like I have got, I, I told you, like I got work specifically from one post and I knew about it. I get referrals from people on LinkedIn because they know me now, whether it always goes to me or someone else in my firm, you know, that's a different thing. Um, but that has happened. So some of this is, um, present mind awareness. And I think, I think we sometimes, um, underestimate that, that when people just know you and they know you're a lawyer, then they think of you. And so that's part of what it is. Um, and, but the other thing is to really be forming relationships with people um, around the world. And I'm not telling you that, you know, so with my marketing and networking, my objectives with LinkedIn are different than some other lawyers. Some yes. lawyers do write about their practice all the time. Um, and some lawyers have done really well with that. I don't, choose to do that because my practice is local government. And so I think it would be somewhat ineffective to do that. Um, and, um, you know, I don't necessarily need to do that in the same way. There are other things that I do in terms of networking in my community that, that um, are more specific to that. Uh, but like, it's, it, it is something where for me, the writing and, you know, being a person, that's part of who I am. And so it's using part of who I am to otherwise leverage a platform to also serve my practice. So referrals, um, opportunities, um, those, all those things have certainly increased. And I'm talking about, you know, I'm still, I, I'm, a, I'm a partner in my firm, but I'm still like relatively, you know, early in my practice. I haven't been practicing 15 years yet. And, you know, one thing that happened recently this year is, I, um, I went and we responded to some RFPs for some business in my area with some local governments. Um, and I walked into some interviews and my competition were attorneys that had been practicing 10 and 20 years more. And I got it. And I think part of it is that I, I have a track record of a reputation as a leader, as a writer, as somebody who is out in the public um, I have been presenting and writing and speaking on various topics um, relating to that for years. And so even though they were older and more experienced, I was the expert. And so that's part of it too. Interesting. And I would, I would assume that even if people aren't finding you first on LinkedIn and coming to you for legal work, that if your name surfaces as a possible um, source of, of legal counseling, they check you out on LinkedIn. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's another way of people finding information um, in addition to your website, for example. Yeah. And I saw uh, Angelo looks like he turned his video on. Do you have a question? Yeah, actually. Uh, you mentioned Instagram when talking about Canva. Um, basically, from a firm perspective, are there any other platforms that you would think would be worth posting on or that you've experienced engagement with? Um, so I will say I was talking from my personal perspective on my personal page on LinkedIn, right. doing company and firm pages is much harder. You can do it, but you got to kind of do it in a different way. Um, and you really, with firm and company pages, you really have to think about really maximizing that network because, because when you run a firm or company page, I have run, I created the LinkedIn page for Mother's Esquire. And so the challenge is that is speaking as an organization um, in some ways, it's kind of nice because when you speak as an organization, you don't have to feel like it's just yourself so much. And so you sort of get a mask to hide behind a little bit. Um, but one thing you kind of have to do is really branch out and showcase other people to sort of get people to see your company page. Now, I am running um, social media for my blog right now. Um, I have not really used Instagram a whole lot personally, but um, I am surprised by the um, quickness with which my Instagram page for my blog has grown. Um, so when I was showing Canva, I generally just use the Instagram sized images because it's a nice square and it works for most profile, most platforms. Um, but yeah, there are, I mean, there are different platforms. Lawyers are on all of them and some do really well on different platforms. 
it's rare that people will be on one person will be on all of them and do really well because we kind of have our own unique skills that sort of position us well to really do well on one or the other. I'm not like a super cool person who takes a bunch of pictures out by the, by the pool or something like that. So Instagram really isn't my jam normally. LinkedIn is much more my speed because it's, it's written based and that's where I feel the most comfortable. But like, even so, um, I've made some nice images about like mindfulness for my blog and people have liked it. I've even tried a few Instagram lives and stuff and done some experimental mm -hmm. stuff there with it. And I'm slowly learning it. So I would kind of say like, if you are, if you really want to see where people go, where people are, it's Instagram. I mean, there's, I think there's just more people there and there's younger people there. So if that's mm -hmm. your market, I would try that too. But like the thing about LinkedIn and Instagram is if you are, if you do LinkedIn and you are writing stuff that can go on an Instagram post too. And like, if you just make an Instagram image to go with it on Canva, then you're set for both. So you can't, I don't recommend like using Hootsuite and just doing a blind, you know, dump of links across platforms because nobody's going to look at that. But if you will tailor and tweak to go across the platforms, you can do that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm on Instagram and I use it. I, I'm not an expert at it, but there are some lawyers that, I mean, there's even a lawyers of Instagram, like hashtag on, on there because people do, do use it. Okay. Thank you. So, so it doesn't look like we've got a ton of people left. So I don't know that we really need to, you know, do like the rest of it. Um, and, you know, if we only have um, a few people, I don't necessarily want to hold people, but um, are there any other questions or anything anyone's 